You are listening to the Marginalized Conflicts podcast series, a project of the Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies course at Colgate University in fall 2008. As a collective, we selected present and past conflicts which we feel are marginalized, either in our own study of history and politics or in dominant narratives of both. We aim to inform, surprise, shock, and inspire. I am Catherine Clark, and today's podcast is about the Cambodian genocide and the continuing effects of war after conflict resolution. In 1975, the communist guerrilla group, the Khmer Rouge, defeated the Cambodian leader of the government, Lan Nol. Pol Pot, the new leader of the Khmer Rouge, vowed to reconstruct Cambodia. In order to do this, he and his regime embarked on a mission to communize Cambodia and cleanse the new state of anyone who might oppose the Khmer Rouge. Mainly, the new leaders targeted individuals and those who were rooted in conventional Cambodian ideals. Can you imagine waking up to soldiers forcing you from your comfortable homes? What would it feel like to leave your cars, your stuffed animals, your televisions, your hot showers, and your beds? What would it feel like to walk the streets taking you from your hometowns, crowded with thousands of people carrying belongings, struggling to stay with their families, and trying to escape the cruelties of the Khmer Rouge army? It's hard to imagine such a shocking and devastating situation. As you walk down that street, surrounded by frenzied and frantic crowds, you do not know when or if you will be able to come home again. Many unsuspecting families will never be reunited, and most will never see their homes again. Having to pack just a few items for a mass exile from the lives you have become so accustomed to living is a hard task to imagine. In an hour, your life can change forever, and you may have no idea what is to come. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge drove the inhabitants of towns and cities from their homes and into organized camps. Anyone who opposed or resisted the mandated move, regardless of his or her physical ability or age, was murdered. The families and civilians did not know where they were being taken or how long they would be away. Teachers, lawyers, doctors, engineers, scientists, or anyone with a high degree in his or her field was wantonly killed. Any sign of supposed intellect, whether it be knowing a foreign language or wearing glasses, was practically a death sentence. At this time, all civil rights were abolished. The Cambodians were no longer treated as human beings. The ones who escaped death were subject to cruel and trying circumstances. Families were separated into different camps. The Khmer Rouge did everything they could to isolate the Cambodian civilians and take away their culture. Cambodians were stripped of their nationality. Literally, the Khmer Rouge changed the name Cambodia to Kampuchea. Even time as they knew it changed. Pol Pot declared the year zero as recognition of the new Kampuchean society and the rejection of the old Cambodian history. The government took away the rights that most people would argue are inalienable. The government inhibited its people's access to food, water, and medical treatment. They banned any religious practice or worship. The citizens were stripped of their property. The occupants were forbidden from showing any signs of affection or developing relationships with one another. They lost the privilege of choosing a spouse or starting a family. Conventional education was banned, and in its place was training for children, which taught them that their family was the Khmer Rouge and that any act that challenged the Khmer Rouge was egregious. These children were taught to spy on their parents and to ensure that their families were supporting the new political and social systems. The Khmer Rouge monitored the civilians' behavior very closely, and anything that was seen as resistance to the new regime was reason for murder. The communes were harsh and laborious, and their inhabitants were given little or no food or basic necessities. Much of the population did not survive. Although it is hard to know the exact numbers, civilian deaths during this period have been estimated at over 2 million people. This figure represents a quarter to a third of the entire Cambodian population that was destroyed by their own rulers. Cambodians and targeted minorities fell at the hands of the Khmer Rouge by executions, widespread disease, exhaustion, and starvation. In 1978, Vietnam invaded Kampuchea and overthrew the Khmer Rouge. This was the so-called end of the Cambodian genocide and the Cambodian killing fields. However, the fighting did not stop. The guerrillas were pushed back and continued to fight the Vietnamese-backed government. The civil unrest continued throughout the 1980s where both sides used landmine tactics and other explosive devices to further their war efforts. The last Vietnamese troops left Cambodia in 1989, 
14 years after the Khmer Rouge first invaded Phnom Penh and overthrew the government. Under a temporary coalition government, Cambodia's name, along with many rights for its civilians, was restored. Civilians were allowed to own property, and the state religion of Buddhism was reinstated. During the period from 1978 to 1989, it is estimated that up to 65,000 people were killed and over 14,000 of whom were civilians. These estimates, coupled with the period from 1975 to 1978, are devastating to the Cambodian population. But the number of casualties does not end with the 1991 peace agreement. Instead, Cambodian civilians still experience the consequences of war even today. These long-lasting effects continue to destroy the Cambodian population and stunt the reconstruction of a stable society. Imagine watching your five-year-old son run ahead of you as you both make your way across the field to find water to bring back to your village. The wind is blowing, the sun is shining, and it is a beautiful day in Cambodia. You have recently escaped the confines of a Khmer Rouge commune. The boy, smiling, turns back to wave at you, and he takes one step to the right. The ground explodes in a cloud of smoke and screeching. Your son flies backwards, landing on the ground covered in blood, his blood. Screaming, you run and carry him to a hospital where the doctors have a lot of experience in treating victims like your son. They cut off his leg and his arm. In an instant, his life has changed. He is an amputee, handicapped. You may think that the casualties and injuries stop when conflict is resolved, but you are wrong. There are many ongoing facets of war. Landmines continue to kill and maim millions of people throughout the world each year. These terrible weapons are strewn across 65 different countries. Landmines are indiscriminate killers. The people who lay these treacherous weapons do not know who their victims will be. Landmines will detonate from the step of a military combatant or the step of a four-year-old child. There is no way to ensure that the landmines explode only on those people directly involved in the conflict. Paul Pot of the Khmer Rouge described landmines as perfect soldiers. They are effective in killing and causing great fear. Landmines are perilous to both the military and the civilians because they destroy both groups, and there is no way to know who will be harmed. Likewise, once landmines are set, they sit in the ground until they are detonated, so there is no way to know when they will go off. There is no way for them to be deactivated when the war is over. Landmines cannot recognize peace. Whether it is a time of conflict or peace, landmines detonate in the same way. There is no signal that switches landmines off in these times of peace. Landmines are put anywhere, and often these places are not marked. This furthers the destructive implications that exist from the nature of landmines. Because landmines are indiscriminate killers that are not turned off when peace returns to the region, they continue to destroy any efforts of reconstruction. In places like Cambodia, where 85% of the population relies on agriculture to survive, landmines restrict the cultivation of the land and inhibit the growth of the population. The presence of such weapons make land that may have been farmed unusable. They create danger for people trying to travel or access water. Families that have been uprooted by war often cannot return home because home is strewn with dangerous landmines. To get an idea of how devastating this can be to rebuilding an economy and society, in Cambodia, 40% of villages have a landmine problem. Landmines cripple the affected population both physically and emotionally. Not only do landmines murder and maim their victims and make their land unusable, but landmines also serve as a constant reminder of the pain and destruction that the people were subjected to during the war. People continue to live in fear after conflict resolution because of the tactics that the regime has put in place during the conflict. The victims remain oppressed even after the war is over. Landmines are a disruption and hindrance to daily life. The best solution to solve the current landmine crisis is to demine the fields. However, this is very expensive. Landmines cost as little as $3 to make, but they cost thousands of dollars to be removed. If they are not removed, it takes decades for the landmines to disintegrate. In fact, there are still active landmines today from World War II. In Cambodia, where there was an estimated 10.6 million landmines laid during the two decades of conflict, it cost well over $500 to remove a single landmine. This figure, compared to the average $30 monthly income, is impossibly high. The people cannot afford to demine the land. Therefore, reconstruction has been slow, and landmines remain a problem even today, 18 years after the peace resolution. It is not a surprise, then, that Cambodia has the highest amputee rate, one in every 290 people. According to the Human Rights Watch, 
As of April 2006, the CMVIS database contained records on 62,638 mine UXO casualties since 1979. 19,333 people were killed and 43,305 injured, including 8,582 amputees. They estimate that 52,501 of these casualties were civilians. Cambodia is not the only country affected by landmines and the ongoing consequences of war. As stated before, landmines contaminate over 65 countries. Worldwide, over 26,000 people die each year from landmines. The Ottawa Treaty, formerly the Convention on the Prohibition of the Use, Stockpiling, Production, and Transfer of Anti-Personal Mines and on Their Destruction, was ratified on March 1, 1999. The treaty completely bans the use of all anti-personal landmines. This is the first step in demining the world and prohibiting landmines from use in future conflicts. However, there are still major governments that have not signed the treaty. The major three are the United States, Russia, and China. I encourage you to write to your congressmen and other representatives to push your country to take a step in the right direction. Imagine a world where children, mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers didn't have to worry about taking a wrong step. To learn more about what you can do to make this vision a reality, please visit hrw.org slash landmines or www.veteransforamerica.org slash r dash programs slash landmind. Thank you. This series is made possible by a collaboration among Clarence Maybe, Ray Nardelli, Rich Grant, Terrell Habercorn, the Student Audio Assistants, and the members of Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University. The music is provided by Poddington Bear. Thank you very much.